We're going to begin with the singing of Psalm 124, the second version, please, page number 121, the Psalm 124, second version, now Israel may say, and that truly, if that the Lord had not our cause maintained, if that the Lord had not our right sustained, when cruel men who us desired to slay rose up in wrath to make of us their prey. We'll stand as we sing Psalm 124. Second version and standing, singing to the glory of God. Let's still ourselves in the Lord's presence together, please. Let us all pray. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the liberty that we have in the Gospel. We thank Thee for what the Holy Spirit of God has revealed to us that are saved, that, that we are sinners, that we are desperate sinners, and that we deserve God's wrath and judgment in hell forevermore. And yet we also thank Thee that the Spirit of God did not leave us in a position of hopelessness, but we thank Thee that Christ was revealed to us 
that there was a Savior that he was willing to save, and that if we come to him, he has promised, I will in no wise cast out. And we rejoice in redemption. We, we thank thee that then the Spirit of God makes us new creatures in Christ. We are changed. And one day we will be changed completely. We will be made like unto our precious Savior, Jesus Christ, and how we look forward to that day. But, O oh, Father, we pray for those in our gathering that don't have any hope, don't have hope of heaven, don't have knowledge of sin forgiven. In fact, still, they know if they were to die in this moment that they would end up in a lost sinner's hell. O oh, God, save them by thy grace today. Save them in this hour. Show them that to be a good person or to go to church or even to read the Bible or any of those things, they're good, but they'll not save them. And we pray that they would trust Christ alone, realizing, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And, O oh God, as we come before thee today, thou knowest the subject in hand, thou knowest the topic that in thy will will be preached upon. And, O oh God, we pray that thou give power, give strength. We pray that thy word will go forth in the demonstration of the Spirit of God. We ask that each one here may be in no doubt as to what the Bible says. And we pray that as we leave, we would not only be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word also. O oh God, move amongst us. O oh God, give us help that alone can come from thee. We do once again pray for those that cannot be with us today, that would love to be in thy house and they're shut in. Lord, bless them. Touch those that are sick and feeling aches and pains and anything else they may be troubled with. Bless thy people today. But, O oh God, revive thy people. O oh God, restore backsliders in this hour. O oh God, save souls we plead of thee and help me as thy servant to preach the whole counsel of God without let or hindrance. But we ask these things in and through the Saviour's lovely and most precious name. Amen. Hymn number 544, please. Hymn number 544, standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honour them the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. I want to do something a little different with this hymn. I don't know if you've ever done it before, but this is something that I was well accustomed with in Liverpool, uh, singing this hymn, when singing this hymn. And as we come to the final chorus after the fourth verse, I want us to sing the tune to the chorus, but with slightly different words. Now, maybe some of you have a pen and a scrap of paper or something like that. Just jot some of these words down as prompters, even if you don't have a scrap of paper, write it on your hand or something so that we can sing it out with zeal. And don't worry, I'll not think you've got a tattoo as we come to shake hands at the door. But when we sing that chorus, we'll sing another version of the chorus. After we've sung the whole hymn, we'll repeat the chorus and we'll sing, dare to be a Protestant, dare to stand alone, dare to say the Bible's true and down with the Church of Rome. Some of you may have heard that chorus before, others may not. But now you've heard it, now we'll sing it. I'll repeat it again. Dare to be a Protestant, dare to stand alone, dare to say the Bible's true and down with the church of Rome. But we'll sing that after we've sung the hymn right through. 544 standing together as we sing, please.
Amen. That's good singing. And I trust it's true that we would dare to be a Protestant people in these days of apostasy and stand firm for Christ no matter what may come before us. We're turning in the Word of God together, please, to 1 John chapter 2, the first epistle general of John chapter 2. We're going to begin our reading at the verse 18, and we're going to read through then to the end of the chapter. And we're going to be looking at the title this morning. Some of you may have seen it advertised online already, but we're going to be looking at the theme, Benedict the 16th, Saint or Scoundrel. Benedict the 16th, Saint or Scoundrel. And it may shock some of you to know that the Bible has an awful lot to say about the Pope and an awful lot to say about Antichrists. But it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, the Word of God speaks to our souls, saying, Little children, it is the last time, as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they are not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, Ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath uh, promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts. At this point in the service, let me welcome each one to the house of God today. It's lovely to see each one, and I trust that the word of God as it goes forth will be a blessing and a challenge to each one of our hearts. Please remember the gospel service tonight at 7 p.m. God willing, we'll be looking at the subject, the prison house of sin, the prison house of sin. And we'll be looking at how you can be liberated from the prison house of sin. That's at 7 o'clock, preceded by a time of prayer at 6.30. And then throughout this coming week, Monday through to Friday, is our church week of prayer, 8 p.m. each night in the church hall. And I trust that you won't be a stranger to the prayer meeting, that you'll come along. Maybe you've never been to a prayer meeting before. Then you come along Monday through to Friday and, and listen to the prayers of God's people, even if you don't want to take part yourself. I trust that it will be a wonderful time of blessing. I know that the minister's week of prayer in the past week was a wonderful time of blessing. It's always a blessing to be in the presence of God and around God's Word. So I trust you'll avail yourselves of this opportunity Monday through to Friday at 8 p.m. And also on the Friday, let me encourage the Youth Fellowship to come along that night. Uh, The prayer meeting isn't just for older ones, it's for all. If you're a child of God, you come along to the place of prayer. Then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class, the usual time of 10.45, and our morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by a half hour of prayer, and then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. And next Sunday will be our Whitfield College covenant offering, so please remember that. 
And let me just say a word of congratulations to all the young people that took part in the Sabbath school exam. I know that you have done very well as per usual, and we appreciate you learning these things. And it's not only for the exam, it'll do you well for life as you hide God's word in your hearts. Please remember the LTBS calendars, they're five pound at the door. Also at the door as we leave, there is the Vision magazine, there's the LTBS quarterly magazine, and there's bookmarks and leaflets and different things that are new today. I trust you'll take them with you. But then for this week, I would appreciate if God's people could remember me in prayer. Friday at 8.45, I'll be taking the uh, assembly in Ruth Island High School. Wonderful opportunity. That'll be the first time God willing will be in since COVID. And uh, we look forward to addressing the whole of the school and bringing the gospel message. And then let me just say that uh, in the past week, I've written a letter to the Lord Mayor of the Armagh, Bambridge and Craig Avon Borough Council. And I'm going to read it. It's only three short paragraphs, but I read it for this sake. I would like you to write as well. You can find his email address or regular address on the AB council website it's easy enough done doesn't have to be a long thing but the lord mayor dup lord mayor mr greenfield opened a book of condolence for the pope in the past week it's something quite astonishing i think it is anyway even if no one else does that a man that is on office on the back of protestant votes would do such a thing as open a book of condolence for the pope it really is unthink unthinkable and I trust that you will write, because that seems to be the only thing that gets a politician moving when there's potential votes being lost, and we remind them of that. But I've written, Dear Lord Mayor, I am writing to you as a Protestant constituent, very concerned at the recent apathy and compromise that has been displayed by you as Lord Mayor of the Armagh, Bambridge, and Craig Avonborough Council. To say that I was flabbergasted that a DUP mayor and further to that, a born-again believer would show such a demonstration of sympathy and condolence for one that has been responsible for the delusion of many a soul in our community and ultimately seen others then damned to eternal destruction due to the heresies of Popish Romanism was an understatement. I could not believe that someone of your standing in evangelical circles and with a personal heritage of free Presbyterian upbringing could do such a thing. Benedict XVI's death may have been, quote-unquote, deeply felt, your words, not mine, in our community. But eulogizing such a character will only cause eternal harm to the souls of men and women still in their sin. I know that you'll be well aware that the Pope of Rome is an antichrist in the sight of God. I trust that before the Lord and in the public domain, you will be willing to repent and apologize in order to make this matter right before God and men. Signed, a very concerned Protestant, the Reverend Daniel Henderson. I trust you will write. I trust that you'll remember this as we stand for God. God has called us to be salt and light in our areas, in our district for him. And let us do that as we have that preserving influence in our day and generation. But please continue to pray for those that are sick, those shut in, and pray that uh, those that have been bereaved, even in the past year, will be comforted at this time also. But all these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. We're going to sing again hymn number 306. Hymn number 306, page number 300. We'll keep our seats for the first part of the hymn while our tithes and offerings are collected for the work of God in this place. 306, I am not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause. Maintain the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. Keeping our seats, 306.
Amen. That's wonderful singing. Now, turning in the Word of God again, please, to 1 John, the first epistle general of John, chapter 2. And the verse 18 is our text today. The verse 18, 1 John 2, verse 18, the Word of God states, Little children, it is the last time, as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Even now are there many antichrists. Pope Benedict, saint or scoundrel. With our Bibles open before God, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, thou knowest the subject matter before us now. And thou knowest the devil will be mad. Thou knowest the devil will attack. Thou knowest that maybe the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if he can't stop the preacher, he can maybe try and hinder the hearer. Lord, make us vigilant in this hour. O God, give us strength to withstand. Give us strength to hear thy word. Give us strength to be doers of the word also. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On Saturday, the 31st of December, 2022, Joseph Ratzinger, commonly known as Pope Benedict XVI, died in a monastery in Vatican City. At that moment, when his body, uh, when his soul left his body, he stood before the holy and the righteous God that he had usurped uh, usurped in his lifetime, and already he has experienced the wrath and judgment of God. Today, sad as it is to say of any soul, he is in a lost sinner's hell. You may say, how do I know such things? I know such things because the Bible tells me such things. The Bible tells us that any that has committed the unpardonable sin of Matthew 12, verses 31 to 32, cannot be forgiven, and that sin will not be forgotten. The Pope has committed such a sin. Come with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12, and the verses 31 and 32. Because here we read the mercy of the Father that he is willing to forgive the sin, even a blasphemy against himself and even against Christ. But he tells that the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, that it cannot be forgiven. It cannot be forgiven. And the Pope has blasphemed God the Holy Spirit. We read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoso speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That is a very solemn portion of Scripture. We're in Matthew's Gospel, so turn to Matthew 23, please. I want you to note by way of introduction that the Pope of Rome has not just had the audacity to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, but in the titles that he takes to himself, he has the audacity to blaspheme all three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In Matthew chapter 23 in the verse 9, we read uh, a very telling portion of Scripture. It says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Now that is not in reference to calling your earthly biological father father. It's talking about calling a man your spiritual father referring to a minister or a priest or a pope. And there is no other spiritual father for men and women other than God the Father. 
And yet we find by the title he takes as, uh, as Pope or Papa, he calls himself the spiritual father of all men, women, boys, girls on the face of the earth, therefore trying to take the place of God the Father. Come with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the, verses, uh, and the verse 5. Because I want you to note that not only does he uh, usurp the title of God the Father, but he also usurps the title of God the Son. And you may hear the Pope at times uh, by the title the Pontiff. I'm sure you've heard that before. Well, the name, the title, the pontiff, means the bridge. In other words, he, he tells us that he is the bridge between God and men. He tells us that he is the go-between between us and the Father. He tells us that he is the, the great and the holy pontiff, therefore usurping the Son. Who do you think the bridge between God and man is? Well, 1 Timothy 2 and the verse 5 tells us there is only one pontiff, there is only one bridge, there is only one mediator. And it says in that verse, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It doesn't say the man Christ Jesus plus the Pope plus any other. It says one mediator. And he usurps and blasphemes God the Son. Turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 14. Because we find not only does he blaspheme God the Father and he blasphemes God the Son, but he blasphemes God the Holy Spirit as well. Because you will hear him take on the title not only of Pope and of Pontiff, but the title Vicar of Christ. In other words, in place of Christ or representative of Christ on earth. There is only one vicar of Christ. There is only one that represents Christ. There is only one that is God on earth representing Christ today among us. And that is the Holy Spirit. That is who Christ sent. Christ did not send the Pope or any other man. He sent the Comforter. We read in John chapter 14 verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And we find that in his titles, this man takes to himself a very unique position. That is why we believe he has committed the unpardonable sin and is in a lost sinner's hell today because he has blasphemed God the Father entitled the Pope. He has blasphemed God the Son in the title the Pontiff, and he has blasphemed God the Holy Spirit by calling himself the Vicar of Christ. Now, such a character has died. Let me also remind you, God doesn't die. There is no funeral service for deity. Nonetheless, this character has died. What did our Protestant leaders have to say? I don't know if any of you have heard them as yet, but I'll, I'll tell you what they said. What did our Protestant leaders say? Let's see. Let's turn to maybe the biggest denomination in the country, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, the right Reverend Dr. John Kirkpatrick. Let's see what this great theological mind and leader of Presbyterianism had to say. Many people across the island of Ireland today will be greatly saddened by the news of the death of Pope Emeritus Benedict. In making contact with Archbishop Eamon, I wanted to pass on my sympathy and express the condolences of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland as we acknowledge the grief being felt by so many of our Roman Catholic neighbors at this particular time. Doesn't sound like a stand for truth, does it? You know, I want to say this. Maybe there's a Presbyterian listening and you've got a belly full of this sort of thing. I ask, will you come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing? Let's just remind ourselves of the doctrinal standards of the Presbyterian church. 
the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 25, section 6, makes it perfectly clear what the moderator should have said. It says, there is no head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. The doctrinal standards of Presbyterianism tell the moderator plainly and clearly that is not the type of character to be eulogized. And yet that's what we find. Well, did the Methodists do any better? Let's see. The president of the Methodist Church in Ireland, the Reverend David Nixon, had this to say. Pope Benedict had a profound influence on the life of the church. His life was deeply rooted in God, and in his teaching he encouraged all to a closer relationship with Jesus in their everyday lives. He was a man of prayer and an insightful theologian. We pray for comfort for all who mourn his loss. I want to ask, are you part of the all of the Methodist president's statement? Did he make you have a closer walk with Jesus? I don't think so. Let's just remind ourselves of what the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, had to say on this subject. John Wesley said, At this time, more especially, will we speak that by grace you are saved through faith, because never was the maintaining this doctrine more seasonable than it is at this day. Nothing but this can effectually prevent the increase of the Romish delusion among us. Tis endless to attack one by one all the errors of that apostate church. It is this doctrine that first drove popery out of these kingdoms, and tis this alone can keep it out. I prefer the first Methodist president's sentiments. But what about the head of the Church of Ireland, Archbishop John McDowell? He said these words, I wish to extend my sympathy on behalf of the Church of Ireland to Archbishop Eamon Martin and to the bishops, priests, deacons, and Roman Catholic people of Ireland on the death of, note this, His Holiness, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. We owe a common debt to him, not least as a biblical scholar and the unique richness of the person of Jesus. I wonder what are the doctrinal statements of Anglicanism? The 39 articles of the church state, Article 37, the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in this realm. Article 31 of Masses they are blasphemous fables and dangerous deceits. Article 28 of the Mass, that it is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture. Article 22, the Romish doctrine concerning purgatory has no warranty of Scripture, but is rather repugnant to the Word of God. That's what Protestantism should be teaching. I tell you, no wonder the judgment of God is upon this land when that is what Protestant pulpits are proclaiming today. It's tragic. Come with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. You know, this ought not to surprise us in many ways because the Lord gives us warning that ultimately there will be men that stand in the pulpits, there will be men that wear clerical collars, there will be men that open Bibles, there will be men that make great declarations before the people and they are nothing better but wolves and they are dangerous to the people of God. Matthew chapter 7 and the verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. How do we know that the moderator of the Presbyterian church is a wolf because you know them by their fruit. How do we know that the president of Methodism is a wolf because we know him by his fruit? How do we know that the head of the Church of Ireland is a wolf because we know him by his fruit? Listen, the word of God is perfectly clear. 
by their fruit ye shall know them. But do you know what I thought was saddest of all? Because I'll be honest, and you're honest too, we didn't expect anything more from those denominations. They've been apostate for a very long time. You know, probably the saddest comment I read was from our king, King Charles III. I want to highlight something, and I have said it before, and I will say it again. As a Protestant people, we are not royalists. People mix this up. We are not royalists. We are not uh, subservient to the king no matter what. We are loyalist, loyal to a Protestant throne, loyal to a Protestant crown. There is a big difference there. When James II decided to bring popery across the land, as a Protestant people, we would not have been loyal to the king. We were loyal to another king, King William III, because we are not royalists, but we are loyalists. But sadly, the king, Charles III, writing to Pope Francis, said, Your holiness, I received the news of the death of your predecessor, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, with deep sadness. I remember with fondness my meeting with His Holiness during my visit to the Vatican in 2009. His visit to the United Kingdom in 2010 was important in strengthening the relations between the Holy See and the United Kingdom. I want us to be reminded of something. Let us be reminded of the King's oath before God and before men, not something centuries ago, not even something decades ago, but something that he said from his lips only months ago after the passing of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. Charles III said this, I will to the utmost of my power maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law. I, Charles III, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion, so help me God. How tragic it is before the man has even reached coronation day that he has already broken his oaths to his people and almighty God. That's the condition of our land today. And we ask, we ask, is it a wonder God is judging us? Is it a wonder when this is how our leaders treat us after making such solemn oaths? Is it a wonder when we think this is the Protestant pulpits of our day? You know, Psalm 2 has a very interesting sentiment for the king. It says in the Psalm 2 in the verses 10 and 11, Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Sadly, these verses have been missed on our monarch. But even though none of the other Protestant pulpits seem to want to do so, and our king doesn't seem to want to do so, according to the word of God and what God gives us in his holy book, I have no problem in denouncing Benedict, his predecessors, and his successors like Francis and others that may follow as scoundrels as men that are leading men, women, boys, and girls to eternal damnation in hell through popish heresy. And therefore, we are to be aware. We are to stand fast against them. We're looking at 1 John 2 and the verse 18. Find the word of God has much to say on these things. And the verse 18 says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. I have no problem in saying to you today that the Pope is an antichrist. Uh, through his blasphemy, through his apostasy, he is an enemy of God, an enemy of Christ, and he is antichrist. And as we look at the verse 18, I want you to note three things with me. You can listen out for them as we go along. I want you to note the age, the antichrists, and then the answer. So number one, the age. Look what it says in the verse 18. 
Little children, it is the last time. Little children, it is the last time. Here we find that John reveals to us the type of age that we are in, the type of day and generation that we are in. And it's very interesting. He begins the verse 18 by saying, little children, little children. Now I want to say that this indicates very plainly, very clearly, that John is not just a young man full of ignorance and novice with too much zeal and too much energy to burn up. We find that John is an older man. He is an experienced man. He is an aged man. He has lived through many decades. And now in writing this first epistle, he is passing on his experience. And in his experience, referring to a younger generation saying, little children, he is giving the next generation a warning. And he says, little children, it is the last time. Little children, it is the last time. You know, God gives us his word so that you can know the age that we are in. God does not intend for us to be in ignorance. God does not want you to be unknowing concerning these things. And we find John uses these warnings in this terminology. Look at chapter 2 and the verse 1, please. Chapter 2 and the verse 1. He says, my little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. You see, he's passing on warnings. He's passing on experience. Come with me to chapter, chapter 5 and the verse 21. Just another touch of what he says. Warnings for experience. An older man telling us this now. And he says in the last verse of this first epistle, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And this is a book of warnings, a letter of warnings. And he warns us now in chapter 2, verse 18, little children, it is the last time. It is the last time. Now, the last days can be argued from being from the cross right through to the Lord's return. But I believe that John is referring to here, and as we read, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, that there is a particular time in view here, essentially the days just prior to the Lord's return. And we find there are warning signs. There are, there are things that we will see in the earth. There are things that will go on in society. There will be a type of age that will be prevalent that will be warnings to us that Christ is coming again soon. And one of those warnings is that there will be antichrist. And we read in 2 Timothy 3 in the verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. It's not going to be easy in the last days. Look at the verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. We see it today, don't we? Covetous, we see it today. Boasters, proud, we see it today. Blasphemers, we see it today. Disobedient to parents, we see it today. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's the sodomite lobby. We see it today. Truce breakers, where men can make a promise and their word is no longer their bond. Liars, we see it today. False accusers, incontinent, fierce. I think today people are far more fierce than they were in days gone by. We see it today. Despisers are those that are good. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. We see it today. Verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. That's talking about those that look like Christians but are not. Denying the power of the, thereof. Verse 5, look at it. I've underlined it in my Bible from such turn away. That's separation. Separation from apostasy. And then we find, look at the verse 12. It says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is the days ahead of us. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And you say, what on earth do I do in light of all of this, preacher? What do I do? Look at the verse 14. But continue. <laughs> but continue. Continue in what? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Verse 16 tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Listen, everyone looking this way a moment. You know when the world seems to be going mad outside? You know when apostasy seems to be rampant? 
You know when it seems like there is wickedness upon wickedness, evil upon evil, truth has fallen in the streets, it seems like the world has gone completely anti-Christ and anti-God. What do we do? We continue. We carry on. It's not popular. It'll not be liked. The devil will be mad. The, the crowd of hell will hate it. But I'll tell you this, you continue. You keep standing for God. That's what the Bible tells us. But come with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. I want you to note the Bible doesn't reveal these things to us just for us to despair. It doesn't do that. The Bible reveals these things to us so that we will have hope. You say that's a, a strange thing to say, isn't it? The Bible reveals all these bad things to us so that we can hope, yes. It reveals these things to us that when you see Antichrist, when you see men like the Pope blaspheming all three persons of the Godhead, when you see Protestant leaders and our King uh, doing that which is unseemly in the sight of God and against their coronation or ordination oaths or whatever else it is, when you see these things, that gives you hope. You say, what? Really? Well, let's see. Luke 21 and the verse 28, it says these words. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. In other words, when you see these things happening, Christ is coming back soon. And you look up and you wait for his appearance. Do we, need, do we not see this in our age today? Does it not seem like our day and generation? Well, we find the age. Come back with me to 1 John 2 and the verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. We see at the end of that verse, whereby we know that it is the last time. John is perfectly clear. But then look at the verse 18 with me, our text. I want you to note not only age, not only the age, but secondly, the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Look what it says. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists. Now, let's slow down at this. Look what it says in the verse 18. It says, as ye have heard that antichrist shall come. Antichrist shall come. Come with me to 2 Thessalonians, please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to tell you very plainly, very clearly, an individual is coming in the last of the last days that is called the Antichrist. One man, one person. We read all about it in 2 Thessalonians 2. You can read all about it in Daniel chapter 8. We believe he will come from that part of the world that is known as Greece or thereabouts. And we find that there is a man, Antichrist, coming. And we read it here, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 to 4. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So we find the warning Paul gives the Thessalonians. Don't necessarily be troubled, but he's saying the day of Christ is at hand. Look at the verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there, be, uh, except there come a falling away first. Now we find those that would say there's going to be a great revival before the Lord's return. I, I don't see it in my Bible. It says, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. You know, when it says that in my Bible, I believe, you know what, that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. <laughs> I just read it and, uh, and you'd believe it. Look what it says, verse 3. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Do you not see that even in the office of a pope? One that exalteth himself above and all that is called God or that is worshipped? so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It sounds very like the Pope. Now, I do not believe that the final Antichrist will be a Pope. I don't believe that. But as C.H. Spurgeon once said, you could arrest the Pope on suspicion of being the Antichrist. 
He comes so close to it. What a tragic, tragic, tragic position. But then what else do we read? Look at the verse 8 of this chapter. It says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. What are we reading there in our Bibles? Keep reading actually in the verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of, uh, of the truth that they might be saved. We find that when the Lord returns, he will destroy Antichrist. What a wonderful truth that is. You know, I'll see it with my own two eyes. I look forward to it as well. When Antichrist will be cast into the lake of fire forever. We'll come to that verse in a moment. But we find in this portion, so Antichrist will appear. He will make himself to be as God before the people. We read that the Lord will destroy him eventually. Look at the verse 11 of that chapter. The verses 11 and 12 tell us ultimately what we are to do in the meantime. It says, for this, God, uh, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. We find it today. That there is this strong delusion going about people where if you hold the truth, you're condemned as a liar. If you're a liar, you're held up as truth. And what do we find in this type of day and generation? What are we to do? Look at the verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. And hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And then look with me in the verse 17. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You see, yes, the word of God reveals Antichrist. And so many like to dwell on this. And I suppose we're dwelling on it for a time today. But I want to say this. The word of God never at any point says panic. It never tells you to despair. It never tells you to be discouraged. It actually says, read this portion, look at this portion, know this portion, see it in the world outside, and comfort your hearts knowing, praise God, the book is right. And if the book is right, then it tells us very clearly, very plainly in the verse 8, then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume. In other words, we're on the victory side. And this is a comfort to us. It really is. But come back with me to 1 John and look at chapter 4 with me. 1 John chapter 4 and the verse 3. We find there is a warning that even though that Antichrist, that one main Antichrist, if you will, has not yet come and not yet been revealed, we find there are many of his ilk. There are many like him. And we read in 1 John 4 in the verse 3, look at it please. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is, in, is it in the world. That, that's what we're reading in our verse. Look at chapter 2 in the verse 18 again. Now, it says, as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, there's a warning here in the verse 18, even now are there many Antichrists. There are many Antichrists. And Benedict was an Antichrist. Francis today is an Antichrist. Many today, still, other than them, are Antichrist. They're Antichrist, anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-truth. And they are evil men. Even now are there many Antichrists. And we find in the verse 22 of our chapter, this is what the word of God reveals the Pope to be, who is a liar. But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. That's what the word of God says. Couldn't be plainer. They are God deniers. But then we find not only the age and the Antichrist, thirdly, the answer. The answer. Because I don't, Preach this topic so that God's people despair. The answer. Look at the verses 20 and 21. Verses 20 and 21. It tells us in our chapter, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, 
and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. We find here there is an answer. The verse 20 tells us that there is an unction. In other words, there is an anointing. There is an endowment. There is a special power conveyed upon the people of God. And look what it says in the verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, from the Spirit of the living God. In other words, true Bible-believing Christians will be present in that day, and true Bible-believing Protestants will know how to deal with the man in hand as well as they stand fast for the truth of the gospel and we find in the verses 20 and 21 this exhortation I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth but because ye know it and that no lie is of the truth in other words you read your bible you know your Bible, and when you know your Bible, you'll not be surprised at antichrists in the world. You'll not be surprised that the Pope blasphemes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You'll not be surprised when the antichrist comes either. And you'll not be surprised that seeing all of these things going on, that eventually, soon, near the time, Christ is coming again. These things are not written for your destruction or despair. They're written for your comfort. Think of it like this. Think of the Jews in the Second World War as they were being rounded up and sent to death camps in 1939, 1940, 1941, and 42, and 43, and 44, and 45. Many of those Jews died of a lack of hope, a lack of hope, not knowing when or if deliverance would ever come. I would submit to you if you were able to tell them with full assurance that on a certain date, at a certain time, in a certain year, that the enemy were going to, the, the enemy were going to be defeated, the friendly forces were going to advance, you're going to be liberated from the concentration camps. To have hope means an awful lot. Many die without hope. You know, there's many Christians without hope. And they fear the last days. As a child, I used to fear reading the book of Revelation. I used to fear reading it because of a lack of hope and not knowing what it said. Friend, God doesn't write these things so that you have no hope. He writes telling you, when you see these things, know that Christ is coming. When you see these things, know that those individuals will be destroyed and consumed by the power of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Be encouraged in it. That's why it's given to us. And what is the answer? Well, come back with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 again. And I want you to note, as we've already noted, but really note it now, the verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the verse 14, and we find that in light of all apostasy, in light of darkness, in light of popes and antichrists, and in the light of the antichrist, in light of everything that's going on, the word of God exhorts the church of Jesus Christ in Monis Lane and right across the globe, continue, keep going. Keep standing for God. Don't compromise. Don't change. Don't bring in modern worship. Don't change your Bible version. Don't lessen the standards. Don't leave aside your Protestantism as if it was some dirty thing. But hold fast. Continue, friend. Even if you stand alone. But continue. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And look at chapter 4 in the verses 1 and 2. The apostle Paul gives a very solemn charge to his young preacher colleague friend in this portion. Chapter 4 verse 1, he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and doctrine. You say, what do I do in a day when there are many antichrists? You continue and you preach the word. What do I do in a day when the antichrist has been revealed? I tell you, you do the same. You continue and you preach the word. What do I do when all the Protestant pulpits seem to apostatize and tossed away their doctrinal standards? What do I do? You continue and you preach the word. 
What do I do when those in authority that should know better, whether it be a king or whether it be a born-again Lord Mayor, what do I do? Friend, you continue and you preach the word. That's what we do. That's what we do. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6 and the verse 16. We find at no point in the Bible, at no point whatsoever, does God ever tell us the compromise will be rewarded. It won't. Apostasy will be dealt with. Compromise will be, uh, will be dealt with. Gimmicks will be dealt with. We are to preach the word. You want to see these pews filled in Money Slain? I tell you this, we preach the word. You want to see souls saved in Money Slain? How will it be done? We preach the word. You want to see something done for God among God's people in reviving power? How will it be done? You preach the word. Compromise will not do God's work. It won't happen. We read in Jeremiah 6, in the verse 16, Thus saith the Lord. It's a fairly good source, isn't it? Jeremiah 6 and the verse 16 doesn't say, Thus saith Daniel Henderson. Doesn't say, Thus saith Jeremiah the prophet either. It says, Thus saith the Lord. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But look at the challenge at the end of the verse 16. What will be your view? But they said, we will not walk therein. There are many Protestant leaders that have said that, haven't they? We will not walk therein. There's many that know better. And God has said, they say we will not walk therein. We will not do that. We will go our own way. We will live for our sin. And we will do damage to the people that hear us. I trust in Money Slain that would never be the case. I trust that God would shut down this church and bulldoze the building before it ever apostatized. I trust that we would stay faithful to the blood on the book no matter what. And I want to encourage you, come with me to Revelation 20. Revelation 20 as we finish. I want to encourage you in this, yes. The Pope is an Antichrist. The Antichrist one day will be revealed. But we find that the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist will one day finally be consumed. Do we look forward to that day? Revelation 20 in the verse 10 tells us, And the devil that deceived, deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, and look at it, and the false prophet are. That's the Antichrist. And the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night, Forever. You know, I love the way the Word of God writes things. It doesn't say forever. Forever is forever. But then it goes on forever and ever. Just in case you're uncertain of it, Antichrist will be finally defeated once and for all, forever complete, forever and ever in the lake of fire. So we find in the Word of God, 1 John 2 and the verse 18, the Pope Benedict is anything but a saint. He is most certainly a scoundrel. He fits the description of a scoundrel. He fits the description, far worse, of an antichrist. And friend, he is in hell today. I take no pleasure in saying it, but he is in hell today. One day there will be a far greater and a far worse that comes. The antichrist. But there is hope in Christ. There is hope in the Son of God. And he is coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. And I exhort God's people, stay on the victory side. Don't compromise, don't change, don't apostatize. But stay with Christ and you'll not go wrong. Maybe there's one here and you say, maybe I am an enemy of God myself. Maybe I'm not even on Christ's side as yet. Friend, I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ died for sinners Shed his blood for sinners. You can repent and believe the gospel and you can be saved today. I trust that you won't put it off because you too, if you stay in that condition, you're an enemy of God, an enemy of Christ. You're one that possesses the same spirit of antichrist. I trust that while there is breath in your body and mercy to your soul, that you'll come to Christ while there's time, seeking the Lord while he may be found, calling upon him while 
he is near. The word of God is perfectly, perfectly plain. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. We're going to sing together hymn number 757, please. Hymn number 757, page number 479. Our fathers knew thee, Rome of old, and evil is thy fame. Thy fond embrace, the galling chain, thy kiss, the blazing flame. Verse 5 says, Our martyred fathers, dying words, as at, they, uh, at the stake they stood, bid us resist thee to the end. Words written in their blood. We'll stand as we sing, 757, please. Father, we do pray in our day and generation that as Protestants we will not disgrace our name. And Father, we look forward to that day when soon the earth will have its rest and peace from such wickedness. And we make it our prayer at the end of that hymn, Good Lord, haste thou that day. Lord, conquer thine enemies, we plead. Help us to stand, even if no one else will. Help us to stand for truth and righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.